thank you all for joining us. I know everyone's logging on right now, um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's WMBA Author Talk. My name is Julie Fry. I am a member of the Women's National Book Association's Greater Philadelphia Chapter, and I serve as the WMBA's Communications and Events Chair. We're so excited to welcome Ruth Coker Burks, the author of the 2021 Great Group Read Selection, All the Young Men. A quick note, if you're joining us on Zoom, feel free to write any questions you have in the Q&A or the chat. We'll be checking them throughout our talk and there will be time at the end for audience questions. Hi, Ruth. Thanks so much for joining us. Hello. Thank you all so much for asking me. This is such an honor. Well, and it was so such an honor to be you know, nominated for your book award. Uh, it's just phenomenal. Thank you so much. Oh, we're so happy that you could join us. Um, as I told Ruth before uh, we started, our book club met last night. So some of you may be members of the book club um, and we love the book. Um, and so I can't wait to share it with those who may not um, have joined us last night or haven't read it yet. So while most people probably have, um, for those who haven't, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what the book is about? Well, I'm Ruth Coker Burks. <laughs> Back in 1984, my friend Bonnie had to have um, her tongue removed from uh, oral cancer, and so I was the friend. I was her friend, her hospital friend, and so I. And I'm not a good sitting in the room kind of person. Um, I like a hall pacer, and you know we. This was our fifth reconstructive surgery over five years, so the nurses and I got to be really good friends and. Bonnie was a wonderful patient, so they always looked forward to having her. And so I was pacing the halls and she was asleep. And I knew that there was a gay patient on the floor and I couldn't really tell what was going on. When I was in Hawaii, <clears throat> the Christmas of 1984, hang on, just 1984, I, uh, my cousin is a hairdresser and he's gay. And so I asked him about this new disease and it was just called gay cancer back then. And he said, oh no, honey, that's just the leather guys in San Francisco that have that. And I thought, whoa, I'm so glad. And what in the world is a leather guy? But I didn't want to act like I didn't know. So I'm mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, the leather guys, of course it's the leather guys. And when I came home, um, he had a friend who I, we became very close while I was over there. And this friend didn't know what was wrong with him. He had no idea. And it ended up that he had AIDS and he just lived a few months after I got back to the mainland. And he didn't have a clue that it, well, he did, but he didn't you know, know anything about AIDS. And he was the first person that I ever knew who died of AIDS. And um, then I just kind of took it from there. I mean, so I'm out in the hallway pacing and this is Lucy, by the way, and I'm pacing the hallways and there's this door that has a big red bag on it. They had just put it up on their biohazard and warning and do not disturb. And so I, uh, the nurses were, I, and these were the, sweetest, kindest, most caring nurses that I'd ever met. And, you know, I would bake cookies and we would eat them all out of the same container. You know how you do when you take something someplace you're going to be for a while. And so um, they had, they were drawing straws to see who would go in and check on him. So they would draw straws once and they would all kind of <laughs> laugh real nervously. And then they would draw again and then they would draw again. And it was, I couldn't believe that they were drawing to see who would go in and check on this young man. So it's, and then after the last, they draw three or four times and then they would just go about their business and their patients down at the far end of the hallways and just ignore him. And his trays were lining up outside the door. And I had never seen a styrofoam uh, tray before. And it had its styrofoam cups and bowls and, you know, the bologna sandwich. It was like they were feeding a prisoner, 
you know, they had bologna sandwich and the juice had tipped over in it and it was all soggy and gross. And he was too sick to come out and get his food off of the floor where you would feed a dog. Mm -hmm. And just think about all the people walking past it with all the hospital stuff on their feet. It was just atrocious. And I am a very nosy person, I will admit that, but I truly believe it was the hand of God that sent me into this young man's room. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it started. And what a legacy you had. <laughs> 30 years plus of being an, a, a, an advocate. Not many yeah. people can say that. Um, no. And you kind of fell into it. I did. And Back then, I was the only straight person taking care of anybody because <clears throat> their friends, they would have slept on somebody's couch and taken care of them while they died and then gone to somebody else's house and taken care of them while they're dying themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and they're watching, you know, and taking care of these people and bathing them. And they know that they're going to weigh less than 75 pounds. They know that this is their fate, but they are still taking care of each other. And it was the most remarkable thing to see and to be able to be included in their world and their life and for them to trust me the way they did. Is such an honor. I mean, it's just a, it was such an honor. One of the things um, at the beginning of the book, you talk about how um, you were working, um, selling, um, oh, sorry. What are they called? <laughs> Timeshares. Time yeah. yeah. Um, and there was one sentence you had in there about how, how you could read people and how like you knew, like if you crossed your arms and then uncrossed your arms and like, you had all these skills that you've learned yeah. through that. Yeah. How do you, how much do you think that ability to communicate with people and to convince people and persuade people helped you earn the trust of the LGBTQ community and and uh, and the, the trust of others that ended up helping you? Right. It wasn't easy. And had it not been for my because in timeshare, you have two hours to sell somebody something for twenty thousand dollars that they don't need and they don't want. <laughs> and they came there to uh, get a free, it was usually a free dinner is what they got. I mean, you know, and it wasn't that expensive back then. I would have bought my own dinner, but, you know, they would get these little prizes that didn't amount to a lot. And, you know, you, just, you know, and it, it is true that if you have somebody like they would be all like this and you know, that means I'm not buying, and they make a pact with each other now, honey. Mm -hmm. We're not buying anything today, no matter what it looks like, no matter what. And I had to, it's called breaking the pact. I had to break that pact that they had together that they didn't know I had, but mm -hmm. that I, they didn't know I knew. But then once I said, you know, I know that just like you and just like me and my husband, we go someplace and he said, you better not act interested at all. But it really is that somebody's real tight there. You're not getting through to them. Mm -hmm. And so if you cross your arms like this and just, you know, eventually let them down, you know, and free them, they will eventually do the same thing. So it was like little things like that, that made it, I, you know, easier. It didn't make it great, but it made it easier. And when I would go in to ask for something from somebody, I usually didn't have to worry about that because I knew who in town was on the down low and, you know, who wasn't. And um, unfortunately, I knew who everybody in town was sleeping with. <laughs> and I, I mean, everybody, men, women, it didn't matter. I knew. And so, but they didn't know I knew. Mm -hmm. And then, but some of them thought, oh God, I bet she knows about me. And so anyway, it all worked out well. And I never went back to the same person again and again. I didn't want to wear them out. If they gave me money to go to a conference, like uh, one of the banks gave me enough money to buy my plane ticket. It was 300. I just saw the book yesterday. It was $325 for the ticket. And so I would know not to go back and ask him for something the next time I needed it. I would go to the other banks in town. And that's how I did and 
dumpster diving and all that cool stuff that everybody wants to do when they grow up. <laughs> but it's amazing. It, uh, the fact that you didn't really know much about AIDS before walking into Jimmy's room to right. the book has a very compressed timeline. It's, it's like what, 10 years? Yeah. 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 And, and the fact that you went from not the full 10 years taking it that all that time you went from no. zero to a hundred and learned so much about the illness within a year or two. Oh, um, it was even, it was sooner than that. Mm -hmm. And the public had not heard of AIDS on TV or in the, uh, any of the magazines like mm -hmm. Newsweek or Time until June or July of 1985, I believe it was, or 84. Yeah. That's and then it was just like a paragraph. It wasn't a whole article about it, just a paragraph. And I wasn't around gay people, but the thing is none of the gay community knew anything about AIDS and what was about to hit them. No one knew anything. They didn't know that this pandemic would just decimate their entire community. Yeah, like your, your cousin had the idea that it was just the leather guys. Yeah. And I'm sure people in Arkansas thought, oh, it's just San Francisco. It's they do something weird, it. but it, it has nothing it. to do with us. And, and that's if they even knew about it at all. Yeah. And I often wondered if the families threw their children out because they were gay or because they had AIDS. And I think that a lot of the parents didn't even know about HIV or AIDS back then. It was because their child was gay. And it was the churches that put the pressure on the families, even though they didn't know you had a gay child. The whole congregation was guilty of having a gay child. And, you know, the sermons really ramped up that that was God's punishment for them. That's this. And I was at a funeral of the loveliest young man you can imagine. And at the not many families took them in. But this family, well, he, they didn't take him in. He was in a nursing home, but, you know, took his body back to bury him back then. And his cousin was a preacher and he goes, well, you know, and waved his hand and he had it over the casket. And he goes, and this is what happens if you live a sinful life. This is, and they had the casket open and he weighed less than 75 pounds. And they wanted to show the world that this is what your wages of sin or death. And there you go, right here's proof. And it's amazing that there's so many people and, yeah. and churches that still have that mindset after so much education yeah. and so much opportunity to, to understand one another um, they didn't that we're all just people yeah they didn't want that opportunity they wanted it the way they wanted it and it uh, it was so heartbreaking you know I went out one time and I didn't do it again to with this young man to tell his parents that he had AIDS and so, you know, they could tell we were nervous and here he's bringing a girl home. So it must mean, and I was their age at the time, you know, mm -hmm. 25. And they were so excited that whatever this thing, gay thing that he thought he was is not true because they're getting married. We were sitting on the sofa and, you know, here comes the tea and crumpets. And man, once he told them what it was, the tea and crumpets, she literally took it out of our hands, slammed it back on the tray and left room and um yeah it, that left him more devastating devastated than if he had you know done something else so I didn't go with another family member to tell anybody anything mm -hmm. I I can't imagine how difficult that would have been to put up some sort of protective barrier for yourself so that you're not yeah. just completely devastated every minute of every day yeah. what was what were some of the things that helped you get through that and not be so depressed all the time though you might have been I don't know I was I was yeah. and um but daddy died when I was five and left me alone my mother was in a tuberculosis sanitarium from the time I was six months so I didn't know her at all and there's a picture in the book where I'm sitting on her lap. And I remember they had to spank me to make me sit on her lap. Mm 
And so, you know, I was used to depression, but man, to watch these men die for no, you know, apparent reason with people not helping them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, here we go. I'll do the, you know, and it was like, you cross your fingers like this and, you know, hope you don't get it. And I remember when I was going back in his room to tell him that his mother wasn't coming, that I just did that. And I said, you know, look, God, if this is what you want me to do, please don't let me and my daughter get it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, he didn't. And uh, so you just keep going. And there were so many of them, you didn't have time to get depressed. Yeah. And plus, they were so funny. They were so charming. They were so full of life and everything. And I learned more about living from them than I ever learned about dying. That's beautiful. It's true. When um, you had this one moment in the book where Allison had to check with you if she could have a drink. Mm -hmm. And so that that was a very real moment for me because that's a mother who's put herself out, but there's still that element. This is my child that I could be risking. Um, exactly. After you said yes and let her have the drink, did did fear ever come in the next oh, of few months? Of course it did. Of course it did. And even that day, <clears throat> these three men were just wonderful. And all of them died within a month of us taking Christmas to their house. And I got the tree and I borrowed Dan, uh, Bonnie's pickup truck. And, you know, we got the tree and the cards and we got everything that they would need for their last Christmas. And so uh, we were at their house and um, they asked Allison if she'd like a Coke. So I thought they'd give her a can of Coke. Mm -hmm. No, because, you know, that's not company. Company gets a, a glass. And so here they bring Allison a glass of Coke and we exchange glances. Mm -hmm. And she was only <clears throat> about five, I think, back then. And we exchanged glances. And I knew the guys were looking at me to see what I would do. And, you know, that right there is where the rubber hits the road. Here I can say that you can drink and you can kiss them and you can hug them and you can do all of this, but there's my baby right there. And so, you know, everything paused midair, here's the glass going to her and everything stopped. And so we all had this nervous laugh and the guys and I talked about it kind of like, you know, and that's why I told them, I said, well, I guess this right here shows my commitment to HIV, well, it wasn't even HIV back then, but to AIDS. And so she drank the Coke and we had a party all afternoon. And it was a party that, you know, that we'll never forget. And they, one of the men taught her how to watercolor and make ornaments to put in the windows and things like that. And it was just the loveliest afternoon. I was really touched by how much um, the men that you you helped became surrogate family members that she yeah. she became, and she was such a, um, a light for them. Yes. Did, um, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, as an adult, has she looked back and talked to you about how that was for her? I know, I know, I know that you said in the epilogue, I believe that you asked her, or no, it wasn't the epilogue. There was one point in the book when you said something to her about stopping potentially, she's like, no, this is what we do. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't talk about it. We never did. You know, we would talk about Billy or we'd talk about somebody who had died, like an incident like Christmas or you know, something goofy that Billy did, but we never talked about AIDS because it was too painful. Yeah. And it was just like having a horrible burn on your arm. You couldn't touch it or wear clothing on it or anything. And, um, you know, just like with Paul, after all of this was said and done, it was like we were in this huge cat fight and then we had to just go back and lick our own wounds. Mm -hmm. And we ne Paul never talked about it for all these years. Unless you knew what happened to him, you, did, you had no idea, none. Well, it's 
people react to trauma in so many different ways. Oh, they do. They yeah. do. It's oh. unbelievable. And, um, you know, it was, they were just so wonderful. They, and they were perfect patients, but they were, you know, they were terrified. Can you imagine being in the hospital for the first time and you're dying? No. And six weeks is it. That's all the time you have left. And most of the times they were dumped at the hospital, they call them taillights because all people would see is the taillights leaving the hospital. And, you know, it was just awful because nobody wanted to be associated with them. Mm -hmm. Just like when I took Billy to the emergency room, it seems like he had an upper respiratory infection or a sinus infection. It had nothing to do with his HIV status at all. And they would not let us, they knew me, they knew me, and they would not let him in the emergency room. And it was in the middle of December, it was freezing outside, and they called the sheriff to come and take him to jail oh because God. they were not equipped to take an AIDS patient. Hmm. And I called the administrator at two o'clock in the morning and I said, well, since I'm awake, you should be awake. And I just want you to know that if Billy is not admitted to your hospital in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to have the news cameras from the TV stations in Little Rock over here for the five o'clock in the morning news. So be sure that you look great. Mm -hmm. And um, he was not happy about it. And, you know, the whole hospital is going to get infected. And I go, you know, that's not true. And if you don't know it's not true, you need to get some education. But he had better be admitted to that hospital in the next five minutes or I will call him from your phone. Mm -hmm. And he did, but he was not happy about it. No, I wouldn't <laughs> imagine he was. Right. You uh, have a lot of nerve <laughs> you're very brave you you um it, it's incredible just reading your story and seeing what you did like you, you mentioned you dumpster dive for food you asked people for help and sometimes they gave it sometimes they didn't you were shunned by people and and to keep coming back shows a lot of empathy on your part and and um it was very courageous to stand up for something you believed in it's a very hard thing for people to do especially when okay. so many people are against them Oh, yeah. Yep. And my church turned against me. And, you know, I'm Methodist. We don't have enough religion to really offend anyone. <laughs> and uh, I was shocked because it was the church where the mayor went and, the, you know, all the mm -hmm. if you were anybody in this town, you went to that church and uh, the ministers were the worst. Oh, my gosh, they were horrible. And um, I was on the finance committee and I was the first woman ever on the finance committee and the youngest person. And I thought, wow, I'm going to go up in the church, you know, into the hierarchy, which is what I wanted. And um, he I asked him at a finance committee meeting where all the bankers and all the big money people were. And we had a budget of over a million dollars in 1985. So, you know, it was a, a lot of money. And he looked at me, didn't even get up. And he said, surely I asked him for one room in the breezeway outside for a support group meeting once a month or whenever. And he goes, surely you're not talking about bringing those people into this church, are you? And I said, oh, no, Dr. Hayes, I'm not talking about bringing those people into this church. I'm talking about walking those people across your new, you know, $60,000 lawn we just had installed for you. And then to your new $300,000 house the church just bought to you and sitting them on the $30,000 worth of new furniture we bought for you. That's what I intend on doing with those people. Mm -hmm. And he took me off the finance committee and I didn't get a room. <laughs> you've mentioned tonight and you've also mentioned throughout your book, your faith and, yes. and being such a pivotal aspect of who you are, having those situations where your minister doesn't treat you or the people you're trying to help well, and the right. people that you go to church with 
don't have want to have things to do with you right. and, and just the sheer enormity of the the life or death situations that you were encountering daily did you ever have any kind of crisis of faith or a wavering or a wondering I never, I never doubted my faith at all not one bit Jesus could have taken my hand and brought me here and said this is what you're going to do and I would have still had as much faith I mean my faith never wavered my faith in human beings did Oh my gosh, but my, and the disappointment, because I thought, oh, well, they just don't know this is happening in their state or their town, because I had all of Arkansas and parts of Mississippi and Tennessee and, you know, within about a five hour drive and um, a radius. And I do, I, I, and um, so I, uh, I was just shocked at the way people reacted and I thought well I just need to say tell the mayor tell the doctors whatever it is look this is happening in our town and we can do something about it and these people were so ah, they didn't want anything to do with it at all period mm -hmm. and they had such a, a marvelous chance to be a human being <laughs> and they chose not to be and it didn't change their minds and we actually had this older, well, he was old back then. And, uh, you know, everybody had whispered about him loudly for years. He had a wife and three daughters and they were the cream of the town and the debutantes and all of that. And uh, they were grown and had families of their own by them. But he was the one in the church that screamed the loudest about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it had always been whispered, um, that he was gay and um or that he liked little boys and he was a pedophile he was not gay he was a pedophile the period and um one day i had cut across town and that's in the black section of town and i had cut across because it was a shortcut to where i was going and there he was he drove a van helping this little 10 year old boy put his bicycle in the back of his van and I stopped just because it was a railroad track and for whatever, and I didn't look at him, but our eyes met for just a split second. So the next Sunday, he came bounding across the uh, sanctuary. He said, oh, the other day, I was just picking up that young man to do yard work for me. I was just picking him up to do yard work. I was helping him with his bicycle so he could do yard work for me. And I said, well, gosh, Mort, I don't remember asking you why you were picking him up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's horrifying. Yeah. Um, I want to move a little bit into more of the, the actual process of writing the book. Yes. Um, had you thought about writing a book? Was that something in your mind when you were no, young? Not, not really, but, um, and I had, my ghostwriter, had it not been for Kevin Carr O'Leary, this book would never be out. Mm -hmm. I had a stroke in 2010, and they told me I had a 75% chance of dying of a fatal stroke that first year. And I couldn't walk, and I couldn't talk, and I couldn't do anything. And uh, my insurance, I was on COBRA from work. And if anybody doesn't know what COBRA is, it's when you leave a job and you can keep the insurance for six months, except you have to pay the part the company paid. So it's horribly expensive. And my last day of COBRA was the day I had my stroke and my new insurance wouldn't take me because now it was a pre-existing condition. So they unceremoniously threw me out of the hospital after two days no therapy no here's how you walk this is what you do absolutely nothing and I had to use what I learned from my guys while they were living waiting to die I used that to teach myself how to walk and how to talk and how to just get out of bed and do it Mm -hmm. And um, I did, but I knew then I, that, and I knew I wasn't going to die. When they told me that, I remember just looking at them like, who do you think you're talking to? Not me. 
and um so that and i get lost so just like right now what was i what was the question uh you were talking about if you thought about writing a book and that kevin oh, yeah. was really and people think that AIDS just happened in San Francisco and New York, and that was it. But, you know, those people had to come from somewhere. And uh, I, this story was just too important not to be told. And I had never seen any books about it. And, you know, all the people who were taking care of people with AIDS had died yeah. because they had AIDS themselves. Mm -hmm. And I felt, and they would tell me before they died that, you know, I was the keeper of their memories and I never wanted them to die. And now the book's in Russia and it was just like my guys just flew around the world picking up more guys and more guys and they've just now touched down in Russia and they're changing lives over there. Uh, before we get back to working with Kevin and the writing process, um, can you share with everyone what you told me before we started about the letter you received from Russia? Yes, I knew, you know, I had signed the uh, translation rights and I didn't know that I signed them and boom, the book's out. I was shocked and I get an email from a gentleman in Russia and he said that, you know, he's like the director of an AIDS program over there, but it is the only AIDS program over there. It's kind of under the cover of darkness because of the political situation. If you're gay and you're in Russia and you've got a group of friends, probably straight friends that are walking down the street, poof, you're gone. Mm -hmm. And you're headed to Siberia for the salt mines, literally. And nobody ever hears from you again. And he said that Russia was exactly like my book back in 1985, that still it's in that kind of a crisis right now, today in 2022. And, you know, he was just begging me for help. And gosh, it's just so horrible to have. And, you know, they were, they're having a big revolution over there, you know, with AIDS and gay and the whole everything and uh you know to know what they're facing is just so daunting and um uh, so we've got a dialogue going back and forth and i have some help that's coming i just can't talk about it right now but i do have help that's coming and um hopefully we can do something and i received a letter from a gentleman in poland and in Poland, they have entire villages and towns that have, you know, a big sign out front, you know, welcome to uh, Rogers, Arkansas, no LGBT people allowed. We are an LGBT free community. And they mean it. They mean it. They'll put you in jail forever or kill you, whichever one they feel like. Yeah. It's amazing just in that amount of time that things have not improved across the world. You hear stories about how back. in Africa, things are similarly mm -hmm. horrible for those who are, who are LGBTQ. Um, and that's a big part of the split in the United Methodist Church is uh, the people in Africa. And a lot of it's over the LGBT community within the Methodist Church because I remember when they first put it out, I haven't been to church in over 30 years because there's not a church that wants me there. I'm not radical at church at all. I just want to go and listen to the music and hear some scripture and, you know, nice robes, nice candles. I like a high church mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, like a little show and uh, anyway, yeah, it's just crazy. But the, you know, Methodists, we just really don't have enough religion to offend anyone. But now that's what has main, that's the main split in the Methodist church. It's amazing that your book was actually published in Russia. When you Isn't think about it, it like Isn't it? with oh their censorship, goodness. it's amazing that there are people that are actually getting your book and actually having their lives know the know that they're not alone that they, that you've been through this and so many other people have been through it and that has to be a comfort but also scary for them at the same time well it is and i'm hoping that maybe it's a roadmap for them yeah. and you know people ask me 
why I did it. And I'm like, well, I, the only thing I did different than anyone else is I'm, I'm not an Old Testament girl. I'm a New Testament girl. And all I did is what Jesus told us to do. Feed the hungry. Take care of the sick. Take care of the poor. That's all I did is what everybody else should have heard. Mm -hmm. Because we did, you know, we would hear a sermon. And Allison was like two, three, four, five. And so, you know, I would explain to her that we were taking lunch to somebody. And I had a lot of elderly shut-in people that I knew in town that, you know, at Christmas and special occasions, we would take their lunches to them. And, you know, some of them I had to take like the extra skin and stuff off of a chicken because I knew, or a turkey, because I knew that they would feed their food to their pets and not have anything left for them. And, uh, you know, just do showing her by example that yeah. this is what we're called to do mm -hmm. and um so anyway that's how it started mm -hmm. but back to the book writing i uh knew that this story had to be told before i died and then i get blood clots in both of my lungs a few years later and i'm like oh man i don't have really good odds here you know living that long so uh they did an article of David Kuhn wrote this fabulous article about me. And that's what started the whole thing. And I started getting in manuscripts from all these unknown people and they wanted to tell their version of my story. And, you know, they just didn't get it right. And I could tell within the first couple of lines. And um, then Kevin, um, sent me his manuscript and when I read it about my heels clacking on the floor I thought this is it he's got it he got it and uh, he said that he was laying on his son's bedroom floor waiting for him to go to sleep writing it on his phone when that image came to him and I you know I never would have told the story I would have taken it to my grave before I would have had it told wrong mm -hmm. And he got, it was like he's psychic. He got their voices perfect. He got my voice perfect. And uh, I read it for Audible. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, it's Kevin Carr O'Leary is a magician here. Did you spend lots of time with him, talking to him, being interviewed by him? Yes, he would call and you know, he would record what we were talking about. And, you know, we would talk for like three hours at a time sometimes. And he came down here a few times and we would take a road trip to Hot Springs and it would be show and tell. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I wanted to take him to where Tim and Jim lived. And I think it was a 12 story building and it was locked and the whole thing, but it was for, you know, people who don't have any money. And they're all sitting out front smoking. And so, you know, we pull up and, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to take him to see my uncle's apartment, you know, where he used to live and or his uncle's apartment where he used to live. And she goes, oh, that's so sweet. And she come let me in. So it's that easy to do things. You just have to do them. Yeah. And, um, you know, he didn't realize that Hot Springs was so close together. It's like a, a a valley and the, it's just that valley is mm -hmm. it and um it's just a it's a beautiful town just absolutely gorgeous with hot water springs it was the first land ever put aside for a national park okay and you know it's the smallest of the national parks and uh it's the second most visited national park in the nation Oh, and know. back then we had six and a half million visitors, not anymore. But besides the people in Hot Springs, I had to protect all these people coming into Hot Springs. And it's kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And we were actually Las Vegas before Las Vegas ever started. Bugsy Siegel was a gangster and he got in a, a gun battle in Hot Springs oh. over the gam we were wide open gambling with casinos everywhere 
and they were where the long evening gowns and tuxedos came in because you didn't go, you weren't allowed in a casino unless you were perfectly quaffed. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, uh, yeah, it was something else. It was uh, a great town to grow up in. With that, there's a a lot of years between when um, you left Hot Springs and when the book was written. Um, During the process of writing, um, what was it like going back and going through your memories? And did you find parts of things you hadn't thought about for years and you realized that you were talking about it? Oh yeah, this thing happened. And what was it like? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm telling you in the winter time, especially, but it got so depressing because I was having to go and dig up memories that I had put away many many years ago and I moved to Florida where my daddy's family was from and uh, we had four category three tornadoes and hurricanes in six weeks and the first one took the roof off Mm -hmm. and you couldn't even get to you know Orlando's got well they have two and a half million people but the suburbs oh my gosh there's no telling how many people live there and you couldn't number one find a roofer and number two even get a permit to put a roof on and so a lot of my things got damaged and I didn't even try to save them because who would want to hear about AIDS nobody had wanted to hear about what I did nobody you know if we were out at a bar having a drink and oh well what do you do and the party was over. It was it. The conversation <laughs> was over. Well, gosh, it's like six o'clock. We better be heading home. And so it ruins your social life. But nobody had ever wanted to hear anything about what I did. So I, you know, when something is damaged, you know, that badly, you don't try to save it. But I would have tried harder had I known yeah. that I would write a book and people would really be interested in this because it was a shock to me mm-hmm. and the guardian i it came out over here during the election it came out on world aids day december 1st of last year when you know the election happened and biden won and trump said no he didn't and we were waiting until december 6th for the election to be ratified mm-hmm. was that the right word anyway and uh, it got lost in all of that. And it came out in January in the United Kingdom and it hit the market in the top 10 of the, uh, you know, London, London Times. Anyway, whatever our New York Times is over best selling, mm-hmm. it hit the London paper over there as um, some guy by the name of Barack something had, was ahead of me. I don't know who he was, but anyway, he had a book just right ahead of me. So I was in good company. And uh, it's the Guardian uh, newspaper said it's the number one read for 2021. So it's just going crazy all over the world, except in the United States. And I don't know why, but I'm happy for it to be anywhere. Well, and touching as, so many lives. It's it's incredible um, as to why it may not have caught fire as much in the United States. All I can say is we live in a very weird country. <laughs> and during very weird times. And very weird times. How has how has the pandemic been for? I mean, you released your book in the pandemic, so author signings and things are limited, but I know, but I had also, book signings but, all over the United States yeah. and Europe. Mm-hmm. And I was supposed to go to Australia. I'm supposed to go to Ireland in, uh, well, it's been, you know, like in February and all these different dates. And now it's in April, but yeah, it was really, it was so disappointing not to have any book signings at all. It was you know, I was all ready and had my suitcase packed and then COVID hits. And, um, you know, you've got to just re-ramp everything. And I learned what Zoom was and how to do that. And I'm glad. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so proud that I've learned all this technical stuff because I am the most non-technical person. And with my stroke, I really have problems 
like that. But, you know, I've learned how to do it and new skills for my resume. How has, um, with the pandemic, with COVID-19, there's been so much talk about what it was like when HIV and AIDS was first being discovered. Has, right. has Have you seen a lot of parallels in, in the way people react to it or treat it or um, just any parallels with the community? You know, medical I find that when it first happened, there was a cruise ship off of the coast of California and uh, <clears throat> Trump wouldn't let it dock. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that or not, but he wouldn't let it dock because I think there were 30 Americans on it yeah. with COVID and he didn't want that number on him. So he thought if he left the ship out in the middle of the ocean, that these people would die and never come back to America and they wouldn't be counted. And so when this man this older gentleman from Nebraska or Iowa or someplace up there, he said, yeah, he said, I got home and he had a little grocery store and he said, nobody would come in my grocery store. And I was discriminated against. And I thought, oh, you poor thing, you know, because he's the kind that would have discriminated and probably did discriminate with people with AIDS and HIV. But what I found is, you know, when HIV and AIDS, were, or A, I call it AIDS because it really wasn't HIV when I was doing it, but um, that people were running away from it as fast as they could and wouldn't help. And with this, you knew you were going to die and you run straight to it mm -hmm. to help. And, mm -hmm. you know, if it, I think, again, if it had been the LGBT community, they would have run away and not help. I think that's where we would have been. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I've got a lot of mixed feelings and I've got some not nice things to say, even though it's a pandemic and nobody can help it still. Yeah, they didn't treat AIDS patients anyway. You know, they're doing everything they can. And, you know, there's people who that when they're putting a ventilator tube down their throats, the last thing they say is this machine's going to give me COVID. I don't have COVID. Yeah. And they're not vaccinated. And, you know, we're and my guys, they would take their AZT. That was the only drug we had back then. And the only thing it did was turn your fingernails black and give you hope. But hope's all you need. That's all you need is a, just a spark of hope and you can do anything. And so, you know, we made it, we made it, but my guys would take their AZT the day they died because they just knew that there'd be a cure coming out the next day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're still waiting and there's a vaccine out there, but They've been dragging their feet on it because, you know, they're making $35,000 a month off of each patient that's on the cocktail. Yeah. That's a lot of money to them lose of. It is. Um, I'm going to quickly ask two more questions and then we'll, okay. I'll, I'll ask, um, see what everybody else has been asking. So I... As I was reading things about you, I came across the fact that there's been some adaptations in the works about your story. And I, I saw that last month there was a play in Las Vegas. Yes. Were, were you involved in that at all? Or how has it been? Not that have at all. Nothing. I, they didn't call to say, here's two tickets. I had a high school in Waco, Texas that paid. They raised the money on GoFundMe to come down to Texas to see their play and it was written by one of the teachers for a competition with 1200 other schools in Texas wow. and uh, that it came in second and surprisingly a school about a, a show about uh, trans uh, people won that year but it came in a hard 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 second and so I'm very proud of that. Well, it's great that your story is being told and that yes. people are, are, are hearing about the work and hopefully they'll take that onto themselves and help other people in ways that they can help. Um, well, when I was they um, in Waco, of course, they're all Baptists down there yeah. and uh, with the uh, Baylor University. And so the gentleman that I was staying in his condo uh, 
he was married and has a daughter and she does not. And so he was putting the key in the door and he kind of stopped midway of putting the key in. And I knew he had something to say, but he, and he finally told us before he let us in the door, he said, well, he said, I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to tell my daughter that I have HIV. He said that he, I forget how he got it, but he never told his daughter, her daughter, you know, his wife knows. And uh, he, um, he never, they never told their daughter. And so he's going to, he went home that night and told his daughter. Now that's bold. Yeah. That's something. And that it was just a one act play that changed his mind. It's an amazing way that, because we're a, a, an organization that loves books, that's right. that's our main purpose is to, <laughs> to love books. Um, and we're open to people of all walks of life. Your only criteria is you have to love books. And right. so for us, the written word is, is, is a big, powerful thing. And when we talk to authors and, and we, especially authors who are, are telling something that's either something they experienced or they're, they've told something that happened, you know, like something that was a historical time that may not have, they, they spread the spotlight, a spotlight on it, you know, right. but we have that kind of information that people just don't know about. And then we have books that can share that experience and share the empathy and help people think about things in different ways. It's, it's just a beautiful process. It so is. I thank it you very is. much for, for taking the time to write your book and tell your story and, and help people. It was very important for me for because these men were lost to history and they were just too cool to lose to history. You know, they were such yeah. cool human beings. And uh, I'm so glad that that came across in the book. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to quickly ask a couple questions that were brought up at the book club and then I will get the ones in the okay. chat. Um, the first question people said was, how did you find the time? <laughs> You just constantly were going in the book. They didn't seem like you had a time where you could just sit down and unless you were watching a movie with Billy, it didn't seem like you right. watched a movie. <laughs> right, right. Well, my ex-husband, you know, when you're divorcing and you tell him, I hope you just blanking drop dead. Well, he did. He was very abusive. He was a horrible human being. And um, I he hid it all from me until after we were married and then oh man he was just a horrible human being and he died in an automobile accident when my daughter was six and you never want your daughter's father to die you just want your ex-husband to die and um anyway i got social security so i didn't have to work a full-time job and i didn't i made enough money that um I didn't have to work. We didn't have any extras at all. I mean, I had enough to pay the rent and utilities and things like that. But um, so that is what gave me the mobility and the time that I had to do what I needed to do. So it's kind of, I was already doing it and keeping it a secret from him because there wasn't a judge alive that wouldn't have taken my daughter away from me for having her first around gay people. And then secondly, this deadly disease that she couldn't catch. But yeah, I had to keep it a secret for many years until 1988 when he died. Was that liberating to be able to, to start actually advocating out in, in public? You know, it was, but I was so stressed out because I didn't know how to be a mother. Well, you know what I mean? I. I didn't think I knew how to be a mother. I didn't think I could raise her on my own. She didn't, you know, we didn't have any family. They were all doing their own crazy stuff. And um, I thought, what am I going to do now with Allison? What am I going to do? And my guys did it for me. I didn't have to even worry. They did it for me. It's a great gift they gave you. Didn't they? Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, here's the question about um, your relationship with Bill Clinton. How did he oh, help right. you? People wanted to know, how did the, he help yeah. you? Because in well, your book, we hear how you were really good about letting him know what was going on, but was there anything that he gave back to you? 
Oh, yes. I had his complete support and I knew it. And, you know, we grew up together. He's older. He graduated with my daughter's father. I don't ever talk about him by name because he doesn't deserve a name. But uh, they went to high school. They were in the same class. And, you know, it was a small town. My mother worked with his mother at the hospital. And, you know, daddy was a World War One and a World War Two veteran. So he was disabled. And um, I can remember when I was little and the president was in uh, high school and college. And uh, I would be out at his uncle's home on the lake. It had a huge screened in porch and uh, everybody would sit there and you'd watch the cigar flame, you know, not the flame, but the. uh, um, Yeah, the ash. Yeah. So I would, my job was to keep everybody filled up with ice and to empty their ashtrays, but I can still see the cigars going up and down in the darkness. And one time uh, he came, well, every time I saw him, he would pick me up and throw me up in the air and catch me. And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. (laughs) And so, but I would take these letters over there and it'd be like 15 page letters and this is what's happening out here. And he called me one time and he said, Ruth, this is happening to our friends too. And, you know, when you have somebody that weighs less than 75 pounds and they're dying, you don't think about them ever having a life and having a job and having all this, but they did. And I took care of people that, you know, had jobs in Washington, D.C. that, you know, were very, very well educated. And they were dying the same way that the people who worked at the bar were dying. Yeah. And he would anything, um, just anything that I needed, he would do for me or see that I it, it just kind of appeared out of the blue. And so. He made it a whole lot easier to get things done. I knew I had a backup. I knew I had an ally. That had to feel good. The same for Hillary. The same for Hillary. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said that had to feel good. It did because he was my only ally. Yeah. He and Hillary. Yeah. All right. Let's go over to the questions over here. Um, Alice says, you thought you were an ordinary person, but it turned out you are a most extraordinary human being. Are you still you. friendly with former President Clinton? Yes, I just uh, got a call the other day about this Russia situation, and he said that he wants to be involved. And so, uh, yeah, he's he's still just as involved as he has always been. That's cool. Um, Catherine says your relationship with your mother she was not very kind to you on some level it can be said abusive can you talk about how her behavior impacted you on an emotional level you know it's like I said in the book you know I came home from school in second grade and she took me outside and uh, made me set my clothes on fire and I only had one dress to wear for the rest of the school year and one pair of shoes, and she always bought them at the Salvation Army, but she'd buy them way too big and stuff them with toilet paper so I would grow into them, and she was, um, she had a horrible reputation in town, and just for being mean, just mean, you know, one time we were at uh, uh, the Piggly Wiggly, And this man said, you bumped my car door. And she goes, no, I didn't. And she really didn't. I was there. He goes, yes, you did. And she said, I'll show you. And she picked up a Coke bottle and broke out all the windows in his car. So, you know, we do stuff like that. She burned three houses down with me there watching. Yeah. When you were a child, did you realize that that was not normal? Or was it something you realized? Okay. no. Yeah, no, the whole town let me know and the family let me know how crazy she was, but, you know. But nobody came to help you. No, no, no. I would have, she would beat me with an electric coffee pot cord. I remember I was down at, I had this route that I did every day on my bicycle all out by the lake. And there was this elderly woman out sweeping her porch and I showed her my legs and she's, from the marks 
and they were still bleeding. She goes, don't show me that. I don't want to see it. I don't want to get involved. Do you think maybe because you, you had to take care of your father and you dealt with the situations with your mom, um, do you think those experiences at such a formative age helped you realize that there was, it kind of prepared you for the work that you end up doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I could see who was suffering. I could see who was anything. I could just tell. And, um, you know, I knew that nobody wanted to get involved just like they didn't want to get involved with a child who was being abused. And so, you know, my mother was very, very sick and she didn't have tuberculosis. She had a, some rare lung disease. There was only three known cases in the United States. And, uh, you know, she was just very, very, very sick. And she was 40 when I was born. And I was 50 when I had my stroke. So I do know how she felt. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I have three grandchildren. I love them. I would never be abusive to them. But, um, you know, she just handled it the only way she knew how. And she came from a very abusive childhood. So, you know, you just learn how to stay out of her way. Mm -hmm. But yes, it, she, uh, you know, it's just like when she got mad and bought all those spaces in the cemetery, you know, they ended up, who would think that 15 years later, a disease would come that would wipe out a particular, you know, group of people and their families didn't even want them to bury them. Yeah. And I had the grave spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, Virginia says, I have appreciated your book so much. Having grown up in Arkansas myself, Pine Bluff, oh, I was wow. astounded by what you could accomplish there with it being, with it being a rather conservative state. You seemed absolutely fearless in your pursuits and didn't express that you felt fear very often, even in hot springs, which was a bit seedy then. How did you <laughs> overcome fear for your personal safety and that of your daughter? I mean, you had crosses lit on fire on your yard oh yeah oh, that's, no that's a, you know that's a threat that's not a that's not not like a, a possible threat that's right very no, it is. and the doctors that lived across the street were happy for me to put out my own fire and I could see them looking out their bedroom windows watching me put out the fire you know why couldn't they stop and help me but um uh, you know, and Hot Springs has always been seedy. It's, yeah, that's its reputation. And, but, um, you know, I'm in Anacostia in Washington, D.C., I went up there and worked with food and friends, delivering food out of the basement of this Presbyterian church. And, you know, they go, well, we've got this order going to Anacostia. I go, oh, I can take it. Well, I didn't know that Anacostia is the most dangerous place in the United States. I had no idea. And here, Alice and I are like, hi, how are you? You know, blah, blah, blah. And we're going up and taking food. But you get to know these people. And I would go back and go, oh, they're just so nice down in Anacostia. What's the problem that people don't want to go? And they're like, they think you're crazy because you look at them in the eye, you smile at them, you talk to them. They think that you are a mentally ill, crazy person and they won't bother you. And they didn't, but they got to know me and they knew what I was doing. And then they would go, well, you know, I've got a brother who's real sick back home. Do you think you could look at him? And people were always saying, do you think you could look at somebody? Do you th and I just had this, I could tell when somebody was within days of dying and usually I could guess it within, you know, 24 hours. And so word just got out in Anacostia that, you know, just like in the beginning in Hot Springs, there's a crazy woman who's not afraid of you, but can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing that you show people that they're people, you treat them as people and they're going to treat exactly. you like a person. It's not that well, complicated, but it seems that it's a concept that's very hard for some people to get. I tell everybody that I treat the president of the United States like an everyday person on the street. And I treat the everyday person on the street like they're the president of the United States. It's a great way to look at it. Yeah.
and to work with people. Um, Christine says, much as what's happening in Africa has to do with the infer interference of American evangelicals in those countries. Ding, 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 yeah. you win, exactly. Exactly, and that, you know, the Methodist church, who would ever think we would be evangelical? But, um, you know, they're fight it's like a snake that you run over and both sides are writhing, even though they're not connected anymore. And they're doing that to themselves. And um, it's, you know, it's just so sad that Jesus, the person that they are wanting to emulate the most, they're emulating the least. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Bible's not hard. It tells you exactly what to do. And, you know, they get too hung up on the uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and, you know, the, uh, you know, we will smite you and, you know, all of these horrible things. And they don't live in the, you know, Corinthians, you know, love thy neighbor, take care of each other, which is where I live. Yeah. It's a big mindset difference. It is, and, it, and it's all the same God and the same Jesus. And it just, you know, we were a very blue state back in the day when uh, Clinton was governor. And um, it we've just turned red in the past few, well, probably the past 20 years. And man, are we red. Uh, we are red. Sarah Huckabee Sanders will probably be our next governor. And, you know, she is so, and her daddy, uh, uh, well, Huckabee, what was, I can't remember his first name. Anyway, when he was governor, we were all standing around someplace talking. And, you know, he asked me what I did and I told him. And um, he was a preacher, a Baptist preacher. And so he came up with a great idea and he was so proud of his idea and it would cure everything if you take all of the people with AIDS and every gay person because his opinion of gay people there's not that many of them and we put them in Guantanamo Bay and imprison them there then AIDS would never be an issue it wouldn't happen anymore and uh, Mike Huckabee and you know that's that's exactly was the mindset and Sarah and the woman who's running for her lieutenant governor, they're running on anti-trans bills. And uh, Leslie Rutledge, who is our attorney general, who uh, is running as her lieutenant governor, she, uh, you know, the trans bathroom bill. And, uh, you know, I try to tell people, trans people don't care what you look like in the bathroom. They care what they look like. If they pass for, you know, whichever sex it is they want to pass for, they don't care what I look like. They don't care what your child looks like. Right. And, um, you know, it's, and I really don't, I've never seen a trans person go into a bathroom in Arkansas. I don't know, you know, I guess they have to go where, you know, it's just awful. It's just awful is all I it's, can say. It's really horrifying that in the the decades yeah. since people started to be more out and right. proud that people can't just let them be out and proud. I know. And it's, um, it's a big it's problem one, we have and it's it's scary to see well, where what's gonna go end up happening down that. here. And I've you know, we had the election, it was like, yay, Biden won, we can be out and proud and all this. And I'm like, we have two years, two years to get anything done we need done because, you know, the midterms come in. Yeah. And that's even more important, basically, to me than the general election because these are the congressmen and senators that make the rules and the president yeah. just like stamps them. And um, they are so, like, with Arkansas Children's Hospital up. 
here, uh, the main ones in Little Rock, and I'm up in the northwest part of the state, and they sent out a letter yesterday that said they have a gender clinic there, which has been open a few years, and I'm like, yay, this is wonderful, and that they had to close it down because somebody filed a lawsuit saying, no, 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 you're not giving my child that. Well, your child doesn't want it, so don't worry about it. But another child, you know, it might keep them alive on this earth. But um, no, it's just horrible. And, uh, you know, they're like, well, now where do we go? Do we take our children all the way to Kansas to get, you know, the medication that they need? And I just feel that the LGBT community will have to go back in the closet and I actually see it getting bad enough to where uh, gay men marry women as beards to protect them. That's horrible. Yeah. I hope that it doesn't go that way. And I hope that I people take too. from your book that, that there's so much that an individual person with no special training can do to help other people in need. And especially people in the LGBTQ community, because they really do right. need allies and uh, advocates. And hopefully people will take that concept from your book and run with it i have people all the time that raise their hand they go oh i want to be an advocate tell me how to be an advocate well first you have to put your phone down <laughs> and if i had had an iphone or any kind of phone i would have been scrolling and you know liking this or liking that and i never would have noticed that bag on the door yeah. I never would have gotten out of Bonnie's room because i had been talking to somebody online mm -hmm. and I never would have seen that young man who desperately needed his mother. And I was so honored to be able to stand in for his mother and to let him die in peace of thinking that I was there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, I don't know. Well, thank you very much for the work that you've done, the people who you've helped and the people you'll continue to help. Well, thank um, you very much. Sure. I have uh, two more things here. Catherine okay. says, who came up with the title? <laughs> uh, they did. We just kind of all came up with it. Um, I knew that it was going to be in the UK and the UK won't let you put angel in the title of anything oh, because... Okay. Yeah, the queen owns the church and right. she owns the word angel too. Yeah. So, you know, you can't put that right. in there. And, uh, you know, it was all the young men. It mm -hmm. was. And, you know, I thought that the cover was brilliant. Mm -hmm. I thought the title was brilliant. And it just all, we, uh, we had a whole list of things to consider. And uh, we just all kind of came up with that together. That's great. It works well. Um, and then Christine says, here in Florida, we now have the don't say gay bill as if that ever oh. worked. Never. It's incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Yep. You know, Florida also, uh, Senator Scott, who was Governor Scott, who never should have been any of those, um, a few years ago, he turned back. Now, when you get a grant, you get the grant, you spend the, all of the money and you fill out forms, you go, oh man, that money was great. And we spent it down to the last penny because if you don't and you send any money back, any money you don't spend, you have to send it back to the federal government. And they go, oh, well, you know, look, they sent this money back so they don't need any in the future. He sent back something like 96 million dollar grant wow. for HIV training, education, uh, condoms, testing, medication, everything. Now, all of the cruise ships that leave the United States, most of them leave from Florida. Yeah. And, you know, those people don't go down there on Bible study. <laughs> and, um, you know, when they are waiting to get on the ship, they're partying on the land. And when after they get off, they're partying on the land and they are on the cruise ship and they're bringing anything they catch back to their families. They're bringing it back to their community. So it's not just a Florida problem. Yeah. It's a United States problem. Mm -hmm. And they he sent that money back saying thanks, but no thanks. 
And God love you all in Florida because you've got a mess down there. And it looks like you're going to have a mess there for a while. And, you know, what do the gay teachers say? You know, everybody's out. So why, what are you telling them that they're not human anymore? That they, you know, the next they'll be firing them. And then the young people, you know, it's not that anybody grows up and goes, you know, I like the way that guy was discriminated against. I like the way they had him, you know, boot on his neck. And, you know, the fact that they called him the F word and the, all these words. And I like the way he's being discriminated against. I want some of that too. Mm -hmm. No, nobody grows up thinking that. They just want to be loved and accepted and cherished like everybody else. And this law is just, I, you know, I could go on for the rest of the night about it. It's just horrible. It is. And it's probably coming to a state near you. Well, I hope that because we can. What they're, uh, yeah, stop what it. they're doing. <laughs> I had a senator tell me that what they're doing is uh, the, and I, you know, I don't want to offend anybody getting political, but I can, but I won't. Anyway, they, um, they take, like, they go on the computer and they send emails to each other and they send these bills around and all they do is cut and paste. And they'll take Missouri out and put Arkansas in. It's the same with abortion, with AIDS, with, uh, you know, LGBT plus. It's just the way it is. And uh, they just really, really, really get, they really get off on torturing people in the name of Jesus. And we have a lot of evangelicals, uh, ministers, uh, evangelists that are in the Senate and they use their constituency as their mailing list. So they're doing two duties that they're not supposed to do on the uh, government dime, but you know, what can we say? Well, we can start talking up and being the advocates that we should be and the allies that we should be. And uh, I thank you for your great example. And I thank you so much for the time you've spent with us tonight. I know that uh, there've been some comments saying that people have really enjoyed the evening and, and, and listening to you and you sharing your story. And I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you all so much, number one, for reading my book and for having me on and for you know making it your book choice. And I'm just so happy and I'm so thrilled. And I just thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Well, you're very welcome. It's our pleasure. <laughs> so we wish everyone to have a good night and thank you for attending. Thank you so much, Ruth, for your time. It was very yes. generous of you to give it to us. And Absolutely. hopefully people can go forth and make some change. That'll be great. And if anybody wants to order an autographed copy, it's out in paperback now also. Okay. They can order it from Two Friends Bookstore in Bentonville, Arkansas. And uh, make sure that you put a note on there, you know, what you want it to say and, you know, their name, correct spelling of their name, because I had to buy two books for somebody because Allison is not just spelled a-L-L-I-S-O-N. It's spelled like a gazillion different ways. And of course, I spelled it wrong. So I had to buy them a book. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, but anything that you want it to say, and then I will go over and sign them and they'll mail it to you. Thank you. Could you repeat the bookstore one more time? It's called Two Friends Bookstore. All right. And um, it's, you know, they started, two friends from grade school had always wanted to start a bookstore, and they started it in November before the plague hit us in December. Wow. And I was able to uh, bring in customers for them so that they could survive the plague, and they did, and they've even hired more staff, so it's Great. a, you know, I wish more authors would do that to help out the independent bookstores. Yeah, we love indie bookstores. They are oh, near and dear to our heart. They are the lifeblood of uh, publishing. So they are, they are. And this is just a little tiny, teeny tiny bookstore, but you know, they're, they're doing they great do such now. a great little bookstores do such great service to the community. They so. do. And 
Bentonville is where, you know, we've got Crystal Bridges Museum of uh, Contemporary Art, and it's really become, they're even putting a new exit on the interstate to get you downtown faster. So yeah, right. there's a lot going on in this little bookstore. It's fabulous. Well, thank you for telling us about it. We will definitely check it out. Yeah, they brought me 15 cases of books to sign uh, <laughs> early on. So, yeah. Talk about a hand cramp. <laughs> I know you. Well, thank you again, Ruth. Thank you for thank everyone who so attended. Much. Thank and everybody for reading my book and for having me on. Well, thank you again. And we hope you all have a great evening. Thanks you so too. much. Okay, take care. Bye. <laughs>